to add another dimension to this conversation, we also have with us Jennifer Henry. Jennifer currently serves as the executive director of Kairos uh, and has worked in ecumenical social justice for over 20 years. Uh, she has represented faith communities in many different movements, global and Canadian, on indigenous rights solidarity, gender justice, international human rights, and economic and ecological justice. And she's here to share a, a theological reflection with us. So welcome, Jennifer. I, uh, I speak today uh, from uh, very aware of being a, a settler and a Christian and very aware of how my ancestors of both blood and faith participated in the process of colonization and how I am its, its beneficiary. But I also speak as a, a mother, and I think a lot in these conversations about my daughter and a, my hopes for a good earth and a good life and a reconciled country for her. I want to uh, express gratitude at being here as a guest on Wabanaki territory and to express also my sense of honor at being in the presence of elders and I'm very hopeful that Alma will consider me a granddaughter <laughs> because I certainly think of her as a, a grandmother. And I'm grateful also to the youth voices that we've had with us over the time and, and, uh, and I think it's been a rich conversation. Uh, we've heard, I think, in the last little while, in these last, this last evening and, and this morning, good scientific reasons and health reasons and economic reasons, policy, human rights reasons to have concerns about fracking. And we also have heard of indigenous spiritual principles that would cause us to have concern and to bring deep concern. And I will share uh, some theological principles from our tradition, from the Christian tradition, that I don't think will be discontinuous with this conversation. I think they will also affirm the concern. And when I speak from our tradition, I'm, I, I'm speaking from our sacred texts, and I'm speaking from our traditions. Indigenous people speak from stories and from the teachings of elders. We speak also from stories uh, and from the teachings of the church over time. And I also hope that there's a concurrence or a sense of connection across those different communities because I don't think it's that, that different. So I'm just going to offer briefly just three lenses or windows through which we could look at this conversation and hope that they might be helpful to us. And as I say, it, it, will be, uh, it will sound similar, I think. The three lenses I want to look through are interdependence, the lens of covenant, and the lens of abundant life. So interdependence. Indigenous people have held uh, faithful to the teachings about the interdependence of all life. But Christians have these teachings, too. The problem is we've suppressed the teachings about the interdependence of all life, and we've let other ones come up that are about hierarchies of life with human beings on the top and everybody else. But the notion of the indigenous notions of all my relations uh, are not um, absent from the story, the, the Christian story, or from the stories in the, in the Jewish text that we share. There are many stories that link what happens to the earth, so the pollution of the earth, with the loss of the well-being of human communities. Uh, when the land is laid waste, when the surface is twisted, the inhabitants are scattered, that's from Isaiah, and the gladness of the earth goes away. So this sense that all of these things are connected to each other, or there's a story, and this is a very poignant one, about how when human beings don't obey the creator's instructions, the earth itself mourns. And how does it mourn? It shows itself in a drought. <laughs> so this idea that when we violate the creator's instructions, that the earth is hurt and harmed and shows itself. Um, or on the positive, how the trees clap their hands when they celebrate right, that, that we are honoring the creator's instructions when they worship the creator, honor the creator. 
This notion that the earth has this kind of emotional bond with the creator, I think affirms that sense of the interdependence of all life that indigenous communities are trying to reteach us, trying to help us remember our own stories in this time. So that notion that when human beings cause ecological harm, uh, then that harm comes back not just to animals and plants and, and the medicines, but also to us, ourselves, in this kind of self-destructive loop. There are many stories about that in our Christian and shared tradition. We, too, hold to this notion of the great web of life in Hebrew, Barat Olam, this great web of life. And so it's that principle that I think we have to look through. That's the window that we have to look at fracking through, right? How... If we know that everything is connected, how does fracking hold up when we think about risks of water overuse and contaminations and seismic activity and the release of methane? Do we have enough sense of inquiry as to how these uh, impacts could harm all of creation now and in future generations? And I think if we look through the interdependence of all life as a lens, we are compelled into a deep, a deep space of concern. Um, so that's the first uh, window I just wanted to look through. The second is about covenant. And many of our sacred stories turn on this idea of covenant, a sacred agreement between God and the people, a notion that when we trust the creator, when we respect the creator's instructions, when we respect the limits of earth, the creator gives us abundance and protection and well-being. If we start to put our trust in other things, if we don't heed natural limits, we break the sacred agreement. And so we, we have these stories of when we break the agreement with the creator, all these things happen and it starts to un, and unravel. And sometimes it's quiet voices that call back to the agreement and sometimes it's the earth itself. And one of the beautiful covenant stories is the one that you will all know about, right? It's the one that happens after the, the great uh, flood. Right? So what's the sign of the covenant that we have? The rainbow, right? The rainbow is an intergenerational, interspecies covenant that God will offer protection um, to all of us. It's, a, it's an important and beautiful sign of that covenant relationship. And so I wonder, looking through the covenant window, whether uh, how much we are uh, ignoring an, at an attention to natural limits, how much we are ignoring that covenant relationship with the creator and somehow throwing back into God's face this promise not to bring destruction. Are we threatening that covenant relationship by being drawn by prophets or by politics or a hubris that doesn't take into account a huge gap in knowledge here in the issue of fracking, a lack of attention to natural limits, uh, a kind of fixation because of our addiction with extraordinary or unconventional ways of, of testing, uh, testing the earth. And of course, covenant is an important image for us also in terms of sacred agreements with one another. And here I think um, the original treaties, we know the original treaties, the peace and friendship treaties that we on the settler side have violated those treaties. And the time now is not to continue the process of violating those treaties by ignoring indigenous voices, by ignoring free prior informed consent, but it's a time to be about renewing and living into those treaties. Going ahead with fracking without free prior and informed consent of indigenous communities furthers the violation that we've been part of and our own failures to live up to the sacred agreements and the covenants we made with one another. Our focus right now in the context of truth and reconciliation for our country has to be about renewing treaty relationships in the name of that reconciliation rather than furthering the violation. So we need the covenants that in our tradition we say that are written on our hearts that we are not able to break. The covenants, uh, Jeremiah talks about, written on our heart. And, and, we, and we need to pray that God gives us the capacity to live up to those covenants, because we have not lived up to, them to this point. How are we going to do that? So when we look through that lens, is fracking going to further 
or break the covenantal relationship uh, we have with God, but also with each other? That's, that's a key question, and I think we know the answer when we see Indigenous communities saying no and us not heeding those instructions. And the last is around abundant life. One of the principles, again, of our sacred tradition is that there's the possibility of abundant life for all. There's a claim that God's dream is for equity and for justice and for us to live in good relations with one another and with creation. And even if that doesn't seem realistic or possible, we, uh, we don't just know another world is possible. We believe that. That's our faith with the hearts and our minds, right? We claim that promise. And Indigenous people in Latin America, have they also claim that with a, a word and a phrase that sometimes they use of buen vivir or living well. So that Christian concept of abundant life and this Indigenous concept of buen vivir or living well, I think are connected. Um, and they offer a paradigm of development that is based not on growth, but on reciprocity, solidarity, respect for nature. And I think the elders' visions in Canada of, of what we could, how we could live together, those original visions of how we could share land and resources were also about living well or abundant life for all. So it's that lens, if we look through that lens, then I don't think we have to be forced into this zero-sum game of jobs on one side and uh, ecological integrity, indigenous rights, as if you have to pick one or the other. You either get jobs or you get indigenous rights and ecological integrity. I think we have to claim that generous possibility that we can have a just and sustainable economy, we can have ecological integrity, we can respect Indigenous rights, that all of that is possible at the same time, and that it's our faith to claim that and say it's possible and to be working actively towards a living out God's dream in our time. And, that's, and, we, and we look for friends to do that with. So we hold on to the notion of what's possible. Um, those are the three lenses for me that I look to this in, but I would just add one more word uh, before I close. I was reading two more words. These are our sacred instructions. These are things that we have often forgotten. Indigenous voices are prophetic, often because they are reminding us to pull those sacred instructions forward and to live them anew. And uh, I don't know more has been an important movement to me, and I think about my participation in it in terms of being idle no more in living up to the sacred instructions I've been given as a person of faith. So these are ours. We, we know we haven't lived up to them. We know we haven't lived up to do justice, love kindness, walk humbly with our God. But it's now our responsibility to be idle no more, to live up to those sacred instructions, and that's my sense of participation. When I was coming here on the plane, I was reading a, a curriculum a Mi'kmaq curriculum. And this beautiful photo, and it will be hard to see it, but is there. 13,000 years of the Mi'kmaq people in this place. Okay, all this red. Do you see this little blue? This is about 400 or so years of European folks down here at the bottom. That was a time of elders living in sustainably in this land. This is, a, this, is, this is the place where those ancestors are buried, where literally the land is made sacred by the bodies of, of people who have lived here before, of indigenous people. And they not only have, should have the legal right to make decisions about this land, but also the moral right because the land is their life literally the life of the, of the people who have lived here before, of the ancestors. It strikes me that in this story, the settler community, we're, we're babies. We're babies in this story. We're babies in the sense of our understanding of this beautiful land. And it strikes me that we would do best to listen to our elders, 
and to listen to the grandmothers when they speak. So I would say that when you stomp, whether it be a round dance or whether it be to a call to be with you in struggle, I will pray that we will come, that we will answer that call. Thank you.